Okay, for our last talk, long awaited, uh, Professor Ilad Alon. He, uh, just a moment, I have a cheat sheet. <laughs> So, Professor Alon, uh, another Stanford grad, one of us, uh, received his PhD in EE from Stanford in 2006. Joined the faculty here at Berkeley in 2007. He uh, received the IBM Faculty Award in 2008, the 2009 Hellman Family Faculty Fund Award, 2010 UC Berkeley Electrical Engineering Outstanding Teaching Award. 2010 ISSCC Jack Raper Award for Outstanding Technology Directions Paper. He's currently a co-director of the Berkeley Wireless Research Center, BWRC, consulting and visiting positions at Cadence, Xilinx, Sun Labs, Intel, AMD, Rambus, HP, and IBM Research, all the biggies. He's worked on digital, analog, and mixed signal integrated circuits for computing, test, and measurement, and high-speed communications. And now, finally, to address the analog question. Correct. <laughs> uh, he's going to give us a talk on injecting Agile into analog design. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Represent the analog side of the deck. Correct. <laughs> All right. So I think you guys are sort of very well familiar with this, but I'm going to sort of cast this in a slightly different light, which is that you know, there's all these really cool products that people have been talking about so far that you know, were kind of the drivers of a lot of the technologies and you know, research that we're doing. Uh, but I wanted to kind of highlight one thing, which is if you just kind of take a brief glance at many of these, yes, there's a whole bunch of heavy-duty computation happening under the hood, which is really a critical enabler. But from a consumer standpoint, the motivation is almost always the interface, right? It's about, hey, how cool is this music that I can hear? Or you know, can I get this display actually into my eye within a seamless way? Or you know, can I get my car to actually drive itself, right? So for better or for worse, despite you know, perhaps the decades of effort that we've attempted to do so far, the real world is indeed still analog. We haven't gone digital just yet. And so as long as that's true, it's actually also going to be the case that all of the sort of ASICs and SOCs that are embedded in these you know, current and future products are going to have substantial analog mixed signal content in them. Right? Whether that's for sensor and actuator front ends, you know, some digital data converter that's just trying to get things into the digital domain so you can actually do the processing on it, you know, radios, power management, all of these things fundamentally are really analog problems at their heart. So with that in mind, and kind of given this goal that Kirsty laid out of, hey, we want to try and take modern chip design, which absolutely has to include a lot of analog mixed signal functionality in it. We want to take modern chip design, and we want to drop the NRE by a factor of two every year. Very clearly, if we do nothing on the analog, you know, that, that becomes the bottleneck within you know, maybe an iteration or two of, of that sort of you know, scaling, so to speak. So what I wanted to do here is kind of give you a notional view, and I should clarify, this is really my own personal view, but I think you know, if you go and look at some of the data, it will match up with this fairly well. I want to give you sort of a notional view of why there is indeed kind of this productivity gap in the analog world. Okay? So if we just kind of look over time at you know, sort of the complexity of the systems that people are dealing with, indeed that's kind of doing the scaling thing, but I'd sort of argue that a lot of times it just does, does these kind of step functions every time some new thing becomes kind of the hot you know, an interesting product to work on, right? So, you know, when the smartphones came around, there was actually a lot of, you know, the touch interface was kind of the key thing, right? And so there's a lot of this analog missing signal stuff that all had to be kind of embedded into this phone that now became kind of the, the key driver, right? Similarly, as we'll talk about in a, more in one second, you know, when people started introducing, and it wasn't actually FinFETs per se, it was really the way they were implementing the fabrication technology, the multiple patterning stuff that, I'll, again, I'll say some more about later. Now, this went and just caused havoc with the way that people traditionally liked to implement their analog circuits. So there was all kinds of stuff that people had to just go in and relearn how do I actually get this done in an efficient way. Now, if I look on the designer productivity side of things, you know, yes, absolutely there is scaling, but I argue it tends to be, again, with these sort of more quantum-like steps where there's just particular tool introductions. If you don't know what these particular initial means, don't worry. You know, if you happen to work at Cadence, you may have a better idea than others do. But if you don't, you know, don't worry, it's not actually that big of a deal. Don't get me wrong, these things are very useful. They do indeed improve your productivity. But kind of the real problem is that at the end of the day, the core loop of what an analog designer is doing largely has not changed over time. Okay, so if you looked at you know, what folks were doing 20, 30, 40 years ago, kind of from a very high level point of view, people are doing very much the same thing today. And again, this is not to say that the tools have not improved, it's just that kind of some of the biggest, biggest bottlenecks, largely speaking, are unsolved, and in some cases may even be getting worse. 
So just for those of you who have not done analog design in a while, uh, I just want to kind of you know, give you my simple, bold down view of what the world looks like for analog designers in the IC you know, world today. And again, this is drastically oversimplified, but you know, it actually captures most, most of what's really important here. So typically speaking, what happens is you're given some specification of you know, some function you need to go and implement. First thing you do is you go and you just draw some circuit schematic representation of that. You run some simulations, you know, the first thing you do inevitably does not work, so you iterate around in that loop a few times, right? You go back and resize or redraw the schematic. You get something that you think works reasonably well. In most companies, you then take this, you know, literal just piece of circuit schematic, you know, this file, you walk it over to your neighbor, or perhaps, you know, the building next door, and say, okay, hey, I want you to take this circuit schematic and now actually draw literally the layout associated with this thing, right? The thing that will actually get fabricated and convert into the real chip, right? So they go and they spend some amount of time doing that layout. They come back, they say, all right, here, here's my layout and I ran the extraction tool for you, so I'm gonna estimate all the parasitics and things like this. You go and you check your design against the specifications and once again, inevitably, that does not work. So then you go back, you tweak some stuff in the schematic, you, send, you hand it back over to the layout person, they go and you know, make some tweaks there and pretty much what ends up happening is you iterate in this loop between you know, laying out, not being right, fixing it, you know, that loop is basically where the critical path really ends up being. Okay, and you spend oftentimes many, many iterations in that loop. So as I mentioned, oh, question, yeah. Are actually shorting that differential input step? This is, no, I don't believe it's actually shorted, but by the way, this is a, you know, these are not meant to be real circuits. This is, you know, just random images to give you an idea of what, you know, what these things look like from a user point of view. Don't take any of that as being something realistic that we're trying to build here. <laughs> And in fact, I'm gonna be even more toy in one second, okay? So, to give you a little bit of an idea of why things are actually getting even worse, particularly if you wanna make use of some of these in more advanced process technologies, you know, for those of you who have not done layout, you know, it pretty literally is just moving polygons around. But to give you kind of, you know, a very simple layman's view of this, you know, to pretend you had a bunch of Lego blocks, and basically the way you build the chip is by sort of saying, hey, I want these different Lego blocks placed in different spots, I can't actually change the sizes of the blocks too, but let's pretend I can't even do that, okay? So I go and I take these different layers and I put them together, and at least for sort of up to about 28 nanometers or so, I can go and build one block, take the thing, you know, maybe rotate it around, you know, put it somewhere else, and you know, most of my job was basically figuring out, well, how close together can I put these things and still sort of make sure that they function individually as they are intended to operate, okay? So in other words, most of the rules were kind of intuitively obvious of, okay, you can't put two things too close to it together, or you, know, you might not actually get the shape you want, but you know, nothing too sort of crazy was happening there. Well, with 16 nanometer, and in particular the introduction of multiple patterning types of techniques, this picture breaks in two kind of very annoying ways. The first is that, sorry, you actually cannot take the original picture and rotate it around anymore, because that just breaks the way the patterning is done, so not allowed. Perhaps even worse than that, uh, and this is you know, sort of where the, I actually intentionally use different colors here, or rather I should say the same color. You know, when people are doing multiple patterning, basically what you're doing is you're breaking up each layer to be sort of formed by two different independent masks. This is what's called you know, a coloring problem. So to put it in the sort of Lego analogy, sorry, green can't be next to green anymore. It has to be next to red. So this means that you can go and build a block, and if you try and take some other block that happens to be colored the wrong way and you put it next to it, oops, Neither one of them works anymore. Okay, so if you think about this from a productivity standpoint, this is a huge pain in the ass, because you know, you've done your design, you wanna use this thing many times, but sorry, its local environment actually can change whether or not the design is even feasible, let alone whether it performs correctly, okay? So this is obviously a pretty big problem, and if that means that you know, from, a, from the standpoint of trying to get improved design productivity, there's really kind of only one knob that we actually have left, which is basically try and reuse the stuff that we've done as many times in as many ways as we possibly can. So for this reason, actually, there's been substantial growth over the last you know, sort of decade, maybe decade and a half, basically in what I'd call the analog mix signal IP market. Okay? And it's expected that this market will continue to grow. So the idea here is you, know, you go, you put in all this hard effort to resolve all these issues, you get you know, your block that now you know, you've qualified and said, yeah, this thing works in whatever it is, you know, the 16 nanometer or 14 nanometer process. You try and sell that to as many people as you can in that particular process. Because moving over to a different process is actually a big pain in the butt, okay? So there is indeed reuse that happens there, and in fact, much of what modern SOC designers are doing is just taking essentially third-party IP and putting it together. 
But unfortunately, I would argue this still doesn't quite give us enough, enough reuse to close this productivity gap, okay? So I want to sort of remind you here, and Kirsty kind of implied this as well, oftentimes the reason you're building an SOC or an ASIC in the first place is that, you know, you've got some secret magic special sauce that you want to bake in, right? This is the thing that enables your product that other people don't have, right? Well, this implies that indeed there's some degree of customization that you are attempting to do. And hey, if the customization you're attempting to do happens to fall inside of the domain of one of these IP blocks, well, sorry, either you get to go back and develop the IP block yourself from scratch, which is, by the way, why you know, many companies like Google, Apple, et cetera, are hiring analog mixed signal designers left and right. You know, many of our students who are sort of specialized in that have been you know, go, uh, basically swallowed up by those industries. Or you can go back, and if you're big enough, you can maybe convince the vendor to you know, change their design for your specific purposes which basically means that you know, they're going to recharge you their entire NRE cost because it's only for you, not for anybody else, right? The other kind of big problem which was hinted at by sort of these pictures I was drawing before was that either which way, you know, either whether you are doing the design yourself or you're going to go and pay the IP vendor, the actual process you go through to do this design is very much serial, right? It's basically all about, okay, I do this initial schematic design, I hand it over to the layout. The layout usually takes a long time, particularly if you have these really weird rules. You extract it, you check that it's, you know, whether it's working or not. Almost always it doesn't the first time around. You just iterate through this over and over and you're very much just sort of stuck in you know, everybody waiting for the next person on the line to come back and tell them, oh yeah, is this good or not? So the approach that obviously we're, we're going to sort of be saying here to try and improve on the situation, it's still the case that reuse is largely the only knob you have. But what I want to argue now is that instead of reusing the sort of results of any particular design, what we instead should be doing is reusing the actual approach, meaning the actual core loop. We should capture how people did that, and that's what we actually need to reuse. Okay? So to be more specific or concrete, if, what, the, what, what I'm really trying to say here is that if I'm an analog designer, my job should no longer be to just deliver one particular instance of a block that does this specific function. Instead, what I should be doing is taking the approach I used to come up with that design, Writing that actually as an executable piece of code, an executable generator, where in the future, if somebody else wanted a similar type of block, what they do is they take the set of parameters that you know, are the input specifications, they plug it into my generator, you push a button, so to speak, and out pops the design that, in theory, would have been the same design I myself would have come up with as a human. Okay? So the point here is that this is really facilitating reuse because now, if there is indeed a new type of design that you want, if it fits into the parameter space of my particular methodology, great. Just change the parameters. You'll get into design out very quickly. Isn't that the definition of CAD? Uh, so the question was, isn't that the definition of CAD? Yes and no. So the, there are definitely, let's say, directions that are similar to this that people have explored over time. This is maybe what you'd call an expert system. The point here, however, is that I don't have some magical algorithm that takes any arbitrary circuit, applies this algorithm to it, and gives you a result. I'm saying. Me, analog designer, I know how to do this one circuit. I write a piece of code that you know, handles variations on that one circuit. And then from a user point of view, they can't tell the difference between a magical you know, general generic CAD algorithm and my sort of specific approach for the circuit. But for me as a user, this is much, much easier. Or rather, to solve the problem of doing that one particular circuit, that's a much easier problem. Because the generic sort of CAD algorithm that you know, solves all analog circuits you know, many, many billions of dollars have been spent on that all, you know, don't get me wrong, there's been progress made, but that's not a solved problem by any stretch of imagination. Yeah, I mean, I'm also for this one around. But the big problem for FinFET has not been this, it's not the DFM rules. Give me a... But the current mills don't match, not yourself here. Um, yeah, so the, 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 the comment was, oh, this is a problem with FinFETs, you know, matching and things like that. We know how to solve those problems. And we can talk in more detail later. That's not your real problem. You have like a whole huge, uh, basically, microprocessor just to solve that problem. I don't think DFM is a real problem. I think that's a real problem. Um, it's not actually DFM. It's really basically the layout extraction uh, performance loop of, you know, you do a design. You think you're going to get whatever it is. You do the layout. It's completely off. And then you start iterating through. And just getting the layout done in the first place is really where you spend most of your time. Ah, so we can, let's have a more detailed discussion. Um, yeah, let's have a more detailed discussion afterwards. You'll see sort of how we're doing it, and you'll see why I think uh, we're not actually that far from each other in some sense. OK, so the other thing I wanted to mention here is that you know, if I actually have a piece of code that's capturing the way a design was created, let's say there is indeed some new feature you want to add in. Well, 
guess what? You don't have to go back and re-engineer what the original person was doing. You just look at the way they did it, right? You look at their code that captures the approach they took, and basically you add in some additional code that captures the feature you want, right? <laughs> the other thing that's important here is that this actually enables you to do the quote-unquote agile thing of overlapping execution, right? You can have somebody that goes and works on the layout generator. You can have somebody else that works on you know, the design methodology part of it, somebody else that works on the schematic generator. They can all be working. At the end of the day, you integrate it all together. OK, so the approach that we've developed to basically facilitate this is something called the Berkeley Analog Generator, or BAG for short. So all this really is is an open source set of Python code that just allows designers to go and literally write out what is the procedure they themselves use to come up with some particular design. Okay? So to put this in a much, let's say, more simple way, BAG is really just a bunch of plumbing that lets you write as code the steps you yourself were taking as a human already to do the design. All right? So BAG has been sort of one of the pillars of essentially this DARPA craft effort that, uh, you know, that Kirsten mentioned earlier. Uh, I should mention we were doing this in close collaboration with Cadence and uh, Northrop Grumman as well. And this, is, you know, this sort of tool chain is now being used quite extensively both within Adept and within BWRC. OK, so to give you a little bit sort of just clarity what I mean here, right? this is again that core analog design loop. What I'm saying is that, hey, let's say that you know, when you go and you draw the layout, you don't have a human do that anymore. Instead, what the human does is writes some piece of code that takes in all the parameters one may have with this particular type of layout that you're working on, you know, writes up how you would connect things together there, and then you connect that up into the rest of the system where you know, if you have some approach that you take to come up with, well, you know, how do I size this transistor, or how do I figure out you know, what the number of them needs to be, or even what topology I use, Again, you just write some piece of code that captures the way you go about making those decisions, what simulations you have to run, what things you have to extract, and so on and so forth. And again, write that a piece of, as a piece of code so that in the future, somebody can just go and give you some set of parameters, re-execute the code, and get a new design out the door. Okay, so at this point, there's usually some very common initial questions that come up. Um, this first one is sort of most common for folks that kind of came from an analog background. And it usually goes something along the lines of, well, you know, my best analog designers you know, kind of finished you know, school long before coding was kind of a standard default practice. And you know, they're analog people, they're weird, so they just don't even like code in the first place. Like that's, you know, it's an evil thing to even talk about. So yes, I am indeed saying that both your analog designers and your layout engineers should go and write code. Okay, now, if you have objections to this, I'm gonna make the shameless plug. If they have problems with that, go hire a Berkeley undergrad. They'll write the code for them in no time flat, okay? And by the way, you can probably hire high school students that will write this code. All right? There's nothing really super sophisticated that we're doing there. This is really all about, hey, what is the approach you yourself took to come up with a design in the first place? OK, so the next question that usually is associated with this is they say, OK, well, fine. Maybe I believe you. I can get somebody that will actually write the code for me. But like, analog design is like this black art. right? I have these magic people that know how to do it. And you know, there are the non-wizards that can't ever get it to work. So, I shouldn't say what I usually say because I'm being recorded, but basically, yeah, that's not true, all right? So essentially, it's true that you do indeed have to sometimes take some time and have sufficient expertise to sit down and say, yeah, systematically, this is the way I came up with this design. This is the way I did it. But you know, if somebody comes to you and says, yeah, you know, this is a black art, that just means, sorry, you don't understand what you're doing well enough yet. And in some cases, that's good because you're doing research. but. To zero order, you know, analog design in general, when people say that, they just don't know what they're doing well enough. If you force them to think about it, if they really are goal, good, they'll come up with an answer. OK, so the next question that usually comes up, and I've hinted at a little bit already, is you know, I said that I'm capturing designer methodology, meaning I'm capturing their approach. So the question that usually sort of pops up is, well, what do you mean by like, a methodology for layout? Because right? layout, again, is literally just you know, drawing polygons and putting them next to each other, and you know, making sure connections are happening and stuff like this. So what I mean by methodology on the layout side is really capturing essentially a floor plan, meaning this set of components should be next to this other set of components. They need to be spaced you know, from each other, let's say by some amount because of some electrical characteristic that I care about. They should move around as I change some of the design parameters in this particular way. So this is really what I mean by sort of a methodology. It's really coming down to coming up with a programmable floor plan. So for this reason, Essentially, there's a low-level API that we've written into BAG where essentially you can just capture any type of floor plan you might be interested in. So literally any poly set of polygons you want to draw, there is a function call you can make that will draw that set of polygons. Now, having said that, that's not a particular produ particularly productive way of doing things. 
Because especially if you're moving around between one process technology to the next, which we've heard a couple times is a very desirable thing to do, you know, that doesn't scale very well because you're literally saying, well, I want you know, this exact layer here and this exact layer there, and you know, those layers may not even exist in one process versus the other. Well, the other sort of interesting thing that's happening is that, again, if you look at these modern technologies because of the way that things are fabricated, if you just look at like the thickness of the design rule manual, the design rule manual is kind of like the thing that's telling you, here are all the rules you have to obey to make this thing correct. The thickness of that manual has also been scaling actually probably at about three to four X per technology generation, okay? So it used to be maybe you had like 100 design rules, now you've got like, you know, tens of thousands. What's really happening is that because all these things become very, very complicated very quickly, what most people have realized is that, well, hey, instead of just trying to draw any picture, any layout that I can possibly think of, I should just standardize everything onto essentially a set of grids and templates. Because at the end of the day, that's what the manufacturing is trying to target, because that's what you know, sort of the high volume digital stuff looks like. So if you just force yourself kind of, you know, to match the worldview that they're taking anyways, this actually simplifies a lot of these questions about you know, how you can write code that actually moves around from one process technology to the next. Because you just say, look, I'm going to assume that everything is indeed on this grid and has some templates underneath it. And then everything I do is just operating on these grid parameters rather than on the real literal layout under the hood until, of course, at the very end when you just push the button to get a specific implementation in one process. So we have a couple of different layout engines that sort of you know, let you do this. I think I'm going to skip over this just in the interest of time. To give you a little bit of idea of sort of how far we've gotten, we've built up actually a number of different circuit generators using this approach. So starting from really simple things like, you know, just like little comparators or resistor ladder DACs, even sort of simple single, you know, SAR ADCs, switch capacitor DACs. The whole idea here is, of course, that these are all hierarchical, right? So once you've got some base, you know, things, you can then start building generators for larger and more complex complete systems. So things like, you know, basically high-speed electrical front ends, uh, you know, full-time relief SAR ADCs, these are all things we've now built up at this point. So again, just to make sure that this is clear, you know, when I say that I have a full-time relief SAR ADC generator, this doesn't mean that there's one monolithic piece of code that's generating everything all at once, right? You first build up, you know, the subunits, so things like, you know, the asynchronous SARs. You then have, like, all the DACs around it to do control of various, you know, biases, offsets, things like this you know, all your clock generation, timing and sampling, all that, all of those are generators in and of themselves, and then you build up the larger system by calling these lower level generators. Again, to be clear, when I say this is a generator, this means that, you know, this is not just one single ADC, but, you know, if you want to change the number of bits, the redundancy you use, you know, how many of these things you put together in parallel to get the sampling rate, you know, how much thermal noise you want, all of these things are just parameters that, you know, you enter it into a file somewhere, and then the approach the designer took to come up with the actual design based on those parameters is captured in the code. Okay, so kind of a couple more common questions that come up with this is sometimes people will say something along the lines of, all right, so fine, so I believe you can write some code that, you know, will sort of mimic the way the human is doing it, but, like, aren't you, like, sacrificing performance? Because isn't there always some magic secret thing that, you know, they twisted somewhere to make it do even better? Short answer is basically no, okay? So if you really capture correctly and, you know, fully the things that the humans are doing, I've never run into a case where the things we were generating actually were doing worse than what the humans were doing. Having said that, it does take some time and effort to really make sure you've fully captured the way things people are act, the way people are actually doing things in the real world. The other question that you know obviously comes up here is, all right, fine. So let's say you want to really move this from you know the let's say the 28 nanometer design to now the latest and greatest 16 or 10 or 7 nanometer or whatever it happens to be. So the trick here is that if you really sort of buy into this approach and you set up you know essentially your code to use the APIs the right way. The large majority of the code that you write is indeed actually independent of the particular process technology. Because if you think about this from a sort of abstraction standpoint, there are electrical things that one may care about that, you know, the way you implement it in the process may affect the numbers that you get, but the approach that you take to try and improve the results is not necessarily specifically dependent on that exact technology. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, there are always tricks that one can play, but once you sort of figure out, well, what was it about the technology that allowed me to play this trick? You can then write the code in a way that understands that higher level sort of, you know, direction that you're exploiting and then, you know, partition things correctly. So just to give you sort of a proof of pudding, uh, you know, proof is in the pudding of, of this. You know, we took that time and relief SAR ADC generator that I mentioned before and literally with, you know, I'd say maybe five or six lines of change of code between these, mostly just realizing things that we didn't know in advance and then sort of kind of being more generic in the way we wrote things. Essentially, the same piece of code is generating this layout in all three of these different process technologies. 
And to be clear, you know, one of them is a fully depleted silicon on insulator, another one is a scaled version of that, but you know, in a completely different foundry, and the third one is you know, a FinFET technology, again, you know, in 16 nanometer with very, very different design rules. Again, same piece of code generates all three of these, quote unquote, at the push of a button. So to kind of briefly wrap up and just you know, sort of say a little bit about where we're going with this, um, I hopefully have convinced you, and perhaps you didn't even need that much convincing to begin with, Analog indeed is going to be a critical part of the ecosystem moving forward. And if that's true, then design productivity on the analog side also must be accelerated just like the overall stack must be. <laughs> so the approach that we're taking here is this generator-based idea where, again, the idea is that you know, designers should be capturing the approach they take as a piece of executable code. And this is really what is enabling you to do a large amount of reuse of their methodology and also operate in a much more agile manner. So pretty much just like any other software ecosystem, you know, the larger the sort of set of available libraries is, the more opportunities you have to really do effective reuse, right? So in order to kind of kickstart this whole thing, we've been working on essentially a preliminary set of these basic generators, right? So things like you know, high-speed serial interfaces, data converters, you know, phase lock loops, clocking circuits, you know, RF transceivers. We're starting to build up kind of this library of essentially generators so that people can now go and, you know, rather than building something from scratch each time, go look at the way we have it captured already. If that meets their needs, great. If not, go and start actually incrementally adding on that rather than starting from scratch. Okay? So with that, uh, I'd just like to sort of, you know, throw out the final pitch here, which is if anyone's interested, please feel free either just directly to contact me or, as I said from the beginning, all this stuff is up in the open source. Uh, so if you'd like kind of, you know, first taste, uh, there's a boot camp that we've developed that you can just go and take a look at uh, over here on GitHub. And I think the slides will be posted somewhere, so you, know, you don't have to like, write down or remember this link uh, at the moment. Okay, so with that, I'd just like to you know, basically thank the folks who are really doing a lot of the work, uh, so particularly the students, so Eric Chang, Jado Khan, uh, Wuron Bei, Jean Kai Wang, and Nathan Nerevsky, uh, my collaborator, Bora Nikolic, as well as some close collaborators from Cadence, uh, Adept BWC, and Kraft for sponsoring all this, and thank you all for your attention. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm from Kedis, um, but I'm the departure so for the advanced of the stars. Um, I think uh, uh, after finishing this, this on this afternoon, maybe I need to learn a lot from you. What kind of requirements you need? Uh, my question is very simple. Uh, you are a layout generator. How do you add? Uh, analog specific constraints like uh, symmetrical placement or uh, whatever same length of the wire, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so the question was basically, you know, we're, we're doing some form of layout generation here, right? And your question was, well, how do I add in like analog constraints, things like symmetry, matching, you know, length constraints and things like this? So the answer is, I do not have a generic tool that does that. I would not claim that anybody will have that anytime soon. What I'm instead saying is that Hey, if you went and asked me how I built, you know, let's just take some particular block, let's say a Surtees receiver, right? If you went and you asked me, hey, how did you lay this thing out? What were the things you did to make sure that, you know, you got all this matching, you got the performance you want, and et cetera? What I'm basically saying is, I don't need a generic algorithm. I just need to tell you how I did it for that block. And if somebody else tells you how they did it for their block, and somebody else tells you how they did it for their block, I'm just going to capture those specific approaches, right? So in other words, what I'm saying is I'm not going to attempt to solve the general problem because that's where you know, the billions of dollars have been thrown at unsuccessfully. I'm just going to solve the, hey, how did I do this specific thing? And as I cover more and more of the space of the specific things that people are interested in, that's where more and more reuse happens. Yeah. So as different people write these generators, is there like a little market? My, my generator is better than yours? And, uh, yeah, so there, there's two aspects to this. So, so, so your, yours is out of business and everybody uses business. Well, yeah, so as, as you're hinting at already, um, there's kind of two directions that this goes. There's the open source side of it, which to be honest, largely will be driven by the universities, right? So you know, we'll go out, we'll put up all our source code, and if somebody else from wherever it is says, oh, you know what, I can do a better job at this ADC than you can, fine, great. Go modify the code, you know, update it, put it out, and everyone will be able to see. On the industry side, most likely there's some spe special magic sauce that people are not necessarily going to want to share. right? But the good and the bad news is that you know, with these large mega corporations, you know, even internally they have problems reusing stuff. 
What will end up happening is they'll have their own sort of you know, parallel repositories or basically sets of code generator bases that they'll develop that then internally, hopefully the same thing will happen. And you know, maybe Intel will never give its stuff to Samsung and Samsung will never give its stuff to Apple, but at least internally they're going to get a much better reuse. And they can always go look at the crazy stuff the universities do and maybe learn something occasionally too. We can always issue it and add our source. It's, it's still a big deal. No? So it's a big deal. So thank you. Yeah. yeah, of course. By the way, I should clarify, I, I didn't explicitly mention it. We've actually taped out these things and measured them and you know, gotten real numbers back. So it's not even just you know, simulation. It's you know, we've gone all the way through. I think there was one more question over here, but perhaps it was already answered. All right. Well, um, I just want to uh, thank you, Lod, thank for you. a great talk. Please take advantage of the open houses of some of the various centers you've heard about and some other ones you didn't hear about in detail. And uh, go Bears! Yeah. Yeah.